Welcome Trinity family and friends to our virtual Bible study entitled Being Christian in a Non-Christian Culture, a study of the letter to the Colossians. Let's join Pastor Victor Davis as he teaches this series. Hello everyone and welcome to our Trinity Baptist Church Bible study that we hold virtually. Uh, we haven't seen you all summer and we hope that you had a wonderful break, retreat and rest and that you got the opportunity to um, not only spend some time vacating and resting but you also had time to spend with the Lord that your relationship with him would grow. We're thankful for those who are joining us at our noon hour as well as our evening hour and we want you to know how blessed we are to, for you to be here with us. Take note of all of our announcements that are on our webpage as well as those that will follow probably during our Bible study today. But to, let's get ready. Um, I don't want to hold your time long. I know you have time to spend with your family. And so we want to delve right into our introduction today as we talk about becoming or being Christians in a non-Christian culture. Our lesson will um, take, be taken from the book of Colossians in the New Testament, one of Paul's letters. And as I stated, this will be virtual um, for the next few weeks as we talk about something that's real to all of us, and that's being a Christian in a non-Christian culture. I, I think that's very obvious to us all that we have this um, constant um, I don't want to use the word war, but this constant pull for those of us who are people of faith about Christianity versus culture. What is right and what is wrong? What do we accept and what we don't accept? What do we reject and what do we um, affirm? So, so, so here we are as Christians born again. Uh, many of us wearing a cross, uh, wearing a tattoo that um, displays our faith. And, and so before I talk about this culture that we live in, I think the very first thing we need to do is have a clear definition of what it means to be a Christian. Um, I, I know, and you've probably heard me say this over and over again, if you're in Trinity Church, that being a Christian is not about what you wear, it's not even about where you worship, it's not about the songs that you like, it's not about how you dress, um, it's not about even the habits that you do, but being a Christian is about following the teachings and the lifestyles of Jesus Christ. You're simply saying that I am a follower and a believer of Jesus. And only those of us who follow Jesus are called his disciples. And what is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. That every day we're constantly learning, trying to adhere to the teachings of Jesus Christ and trying to be God-like in every aspect of our lives. And we are trying to be conformed um, that's what that scripture says, be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed. We're trying to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if, we are, um, and if we are conformed to the image of Christ, that means we do unto others as Christ would have, as we would have them do unto us. That we treat our brothers and our sisters, those who are believers even, those who are not believers, just like we want to be treated. So, so that's what a Christian is. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about culture, because you ought not be in a fight unless you know who you're fighting against. You and I are called to be Christians in the culture that we're in, and we are in the American culture, and I'm going to talk about that just a little bit later, about the diversity of the American culture. And the culture that Christians are called to be in, you're called to be a Christian in a culture that is influenced by several things that are constantly going on and that change. One of the things that we as Christians ought to understand that even though language, customs, beliefs, attitudes, arts, drama, music, food, um, behavior, and rituals change, in the culture, our faith and religion ought not change. 
as individuals. You, so, so the culture is where we live and what's influenced around us, the attitudes, the mores, and the social norms that influence their everyday thinking and lives. For example, it has been said about the United States of America that oftentimes the votes of the Supreme Court are reflective of the population of the people at that time. So, so when we have a more liberal justice, that they vote more liberal or more moderate as a result of what the social norms are of that time. If we have a more conservative um, court, that they vote according to what the court, um, what the culture's norms are of that time. So, so you and I are influenced by that. Now, don't, let's be honest. Let's be honest and transparent with ourselves. We ought not walk around here saying that the culture doesn't influence us. Yes, it does. Uh, how we think, how we dress, what we do, when we do it, and how we do it. For example, if the culture did not influence us, we would have church at any time. But most of us have church at 11 o'clock, especially prior to COVID. After COVID, the culture changed because of COVID. Many churches who were having multiple services reduced their services. Some, some churches um, never went back to in-person. They have a virtual ministry now. So, so the culture does influence us. The question is, do we allow the culture to change our belief system and how we approach our lives as a Christian every day? So not only does the culture, now that, that's the culture, but then there's this greater influence that you and I have, and it's called pop culture. Now, now pop culture, which is on the previous slide, is influenced by social media and the media and the arts and the music that we hear every day. Now, now our children can help us with the pop culture. For, for example, I'm going to give you one pop culture that I don't understand right now, that it's 100 degrees outside and young people are wearing uh, hoodies. Uh, and not, they're just not wearing the hoodie. I mean, they're putting it over their heads and zipping it all the way up. I don't understand that pop culture. But, I, but my mama didn't understand us wanting to wear parachute pants. Some of y'all remember that in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, uh, and a short grandmama didn't understand mama wanted to wear bell bottoms and, and hot pants and mini skirts. So, so every culture is influenced by the pop culture that's going on. And that pop culture influences our church oftentimes. If you, um, uh, those who are musicians, um, and you stick to the genre, you understand the genres of music, you will recognize that when Andre Crouch and the Hawkins um, family came out in the early 70s with a new sound of gospel that was influenced by jazz and, and, and the R&B rhythms, even James Cleveland wrote some songs or rewrote them, that, that, that many who were in the mainline traditional church didn't like that music because it was the pop culture in influencing the music. But but now those songs are traditional in our lives. Um, we don't think, as a matter of fact, we want you hear people say, I want to go back to the old songs. And they're referring to the Andre Crouch song, the Hawkins songs, and some of James Cleveland's songs. So it is not uh, it is not Christianity versus the culture. It is not the culture versus Christianity. It is living your life as a Christian in a non-Christian culture. How do I maintain my lifestyle as a believer in Jesus Christ in a culture that does not cultivate that kind of lifestyle? All right? So, so, so and understand that this question has been asked, this question has been wrestled with since the time of Jesus. How do we do what we do and be who we are when everything around us is not contributing to the lifestyle that we profess that we ought to live? So let me tell you some things. Christianity or culture versus religion. Culture versus religion. Our culture encompasses religion where religion is a subset of the culture. Everybody in the culture is not religious. And we have to respect that. Everybody doesn't believe what you believe in. Everybody may never believe what you believe. But you as a believer have a mandate to treat them like you want to be treated. Um, we acquire book knowledge in the culture. In the culture, you, you acquire book knowledge. You get educated. And you're, you're actually graded on that, hired on that. But in religion, you have a belief system. 
that, 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 that we do what we do because we are Christians. We don't do it because of knowledge. We do it because of what we believe. We are focused on the people of the society where, where in religion we focus on our relationship with the supreme being who helps us handle society. Um, we, we always looking at in the culture human existence and how their traditions are, are, are affecting us. Uh, but in, in religion, we see the revelation of the supreme being and how it affects humanity. Uh, in culture, we oftentimes are very practical. You know, it's, it's black and white. But in religion, we refer to uh, what's in the text and what it what's translated to us. And then in the culture, you and I know that things are always changing. Nothing stays the same. When people say to me, oh, pastor, we ought not change a thing. And I say, well, you're not wearing the same clothes you wore 20 years ago. So why do you want to approach this the same way you did 20 years ago? And so, uh, but our religion is fixed on the beginning. Now, here are seven reasons. Seven reasons in our introduction why Christians should know or be engaged with the culture. And I'm sure there's some that you could add to this, like listening to the young people. Let me say that again. Listening to the young people. And when I say listening to them, not listening to them to correct them, but listening to them to hear them and listen to where they're coming from. So here's some things. You can't, uh, you can't avoid being culturally engaged uh, uh, unless you're going on a mountain somewhere and, and declaring that you, know, you are no longer part of the everyday systems. You, 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 can't, you cannot deny that. Um, you, you are on a mission to engage. A part of being who we are in this society means that we have to encounter and be a part of engaging with people. You can't be a Christian on an island to yourself. You need to recognize that as a Christian in this culture, you are salt and light to the culture. That in this culture, we are what people see about our faith. Our attitudes affect the atmosphere of what is going on about our faith. That's how we're salt. We, we, we accentuate. Everybody knows that, that salt has its purpose, especially in soul food cooking. It has its purpose in helping food to taste good. It even is used as a preservative. It's even used as a cleanser, but too much salt. Too much salt can destroy, harm, and hurt. And then we are the light of the world, that when people see us, they ought to see God. Um, we are the image of God, and, and you have a culture mandate that we ought to be his witnesses in Judea and to Samaria and, and to the other most parts of the world, in your family, on your job, even in your church, in your community. And you have family, even, your, even if you're single. And you must know what you will face is critics. Somebody is always going to be questioning how you are a Christian in this culture that's non-Christian. I have a post up on Facebook, and if you watch my Facebook post, which I'm sure many of you do because you're probably watching um, the Bible study today on Facebook, and if you are watching it on Facebook, please push like or love or push some comment there that lets us know you're engaged with us and, and helps us to maintain our social media presence. I thank you in advance, but, but I have one of those um, sayings on Facebook uh, the other day. Let me see if I can remember. It says that um, the first one says, um, me, don't take my Christianity for granted. I will take you out because I'm from the south side of the kingdom. You know, somebody says, you know, you know, you know, people think they can take advantage of you because you're a Christian, say anything to you out of the way, and that you're not supposed to come back at them. Well, my response is Jesus was not a punk. Don't take, don't take it wrong. Don't take my cross for granted. Uh, you say something to me out of the way, expect for me to come back at you. And certainly don't cross the line because I ain't always walking in my Christianity in the culture that's around me. All right? So come on, let's be honest with each other. I'm sure I got a whole lot of amens on our post right there. All right. Now that's our introduction. Christianity versus culture. That you and I now know that we are called as Christians, we are called as Christians 
to exist in the culture. It is not culture versus Christianity. It is Christians in the culture being examples of Christ of, of, for those whom we come in contact with. Now, our foundational scripture is taken from the book of or the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Um, you will hear throughout our next few weeks about how this church was struggling um, under Roman influence as they were Gentiles, predominantly Gentiles, which means they were not born in Judaism, but they adopted the Judaism um, belief system that God, one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. Now, you and I know from other teachings that we've had that any time the Gentiles came into the faith that there were Jews who demanded that they take on the traditions, the cultures, the norms, and the mores of the Jewish walk. And, and Paul is constantly teaching them that, that you must accept them as they are because faith without works is what? Dead. That we are saved by faith. So here we are located in modern day Turkey close to Laodicea. Um, um, ancient trade route to Euphrates Valley. The church started with Ephraim and Timothy who were mentees of Paul and it was home to Philemon and it was written by Paul around AD 61. It was uh, the purpose of this letter that Paul writes to the church at Colossae, to the Colossians, was to teach principles for Christian life in a non-Christian culture. Isn't that what all of us are trying to do? We want to know how to live a Christian life in a non-Christian culture. Now, there's some that say, I, we just want to live, or you might say it like this, I want to live saved in an unsaved world. I want to live a Christian life in a, in a, in a community where there is no regards for Christianity or any other kind of standard of life. All right, that's what this lesson is about. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Now, first thing I need you to understand um, and, and I'm sure there are those out there that might catch this lesson and want to retort at me about what I'm about to say. We must accept the fact that we have Americanized Jesus the Christ. That oftentimes our translation, our interpretation of who Jesus is, is influenced by the culture of the country that we live in. I know that's going to be hard for some um, Christian nationalists. Being a Christian in a non-Christian world is not about Christian nationalism, which is what we're hearing a lot in our community now. And Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. That is not what being a Christian is. First of all, even though our pledge says we're one nation under God, we know that there are many nations under God and that there are many nations who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Secondly, the Bible clearly teaches separation of church and state. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and unto God what is God. That's what Jesus said when the disciples asked him about paying taxes. That you are to respect, you are to abide, abide by, you are to even um, pray for those who have rule over you in political, um, political positions and that you are to understand their role. It even teaches that sometimes God allows ungodly rulers as a result of the choices that the godly chosen folk have chosen to live. So, 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 so that, that, that's, that, that's number one. Number one, number two. Number three, United States of America was not founded on Christian principles. Even though we have a pledge, even though we have a constitution, even though forefathers who did not include people who look like me in their thought process mention God, 
it was for the religious freedom from our mother country or their mother country let me say, of England that we wanted the right to be free to worship however we deem so. So America really is a, um, how can I, a diverse founded country of several um, ethnic groups. And let's not forget the native brothers and sisters who were here when we got here. Okay, so, so, so whether we are Indians that were born here, Native Americans, whether we were slaves in the bow of the ship, or whether we were the captain guiding the ship, America is a country made up of several cultures, even several faiths and several walks. So being a Christian in a non-Christian culture is not about, nat or not about Christian nationalism, all right? What are the main characteristics and issues that we see in this book of Colossians? And I encourage you, your assignment is make sure you read it. Um, get ready for our next lesson. And we, we're not finished yet, so keep walking with me. Our main characters and issues are Paul, um, who is a prisoner in Rome awaiting trial. I mean, who is at a prisoner in Rome awaiting trial under Caesar. That should have been my mistake, right? And typing there too fast. Um, and he has mentees of, of Phryas, and who was from Colossae as well as um, Timothy. Um, it is a mostly Gentile community being pressured to follow the laws of Jews. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And then in the midst of that, there were false teaching, mysticism, and legalism, and traditions going on, mixing paganism and tradition. And then there was this mystic cult and Gnosticism were the biggest threats to them. Now let me tell you what being a mystic is. Being a mystic, uh, um, I'm going to um, try to make it simple because I've got on the slide a very um, intellectual, if you will, um, intellectual um, uh, definition. But but let me let me um, go to the end of that definition. Being a mystic is someone who's walking on the ground but always in touch with heaven. That, that's the best way. I, it is, it is um, for those of you that knew Howard Thurman or read Howard Thurman books, that, that's one of our black mystic. Or, or, and, and for some of us, it would be somebody of old and saged age that, um, um, that, that folk know always had and in tune with the divine beyond the normal. And so there were these mystic, cult, mystic cults going on that were pulling people from um, the faith walk and, and telling them that, you know, these people that they wanted them to follow, that they were paying money to, that they were worshiping, uh, um, that they were seeing even do um, miraculous things, and, and they, they had some special being. And then there was Gnosticism. Now, everybody knows Gnosticism because Gnosticism comes from the word knowledge, just put a K, take away the A, not knowledge, and everybody know what a somebody who is narcissistic is. That's somebody who is self-absorbed. They are wrapped up in themselves, which is a very small package. Now, now, so, so being a Gnostic means that you believe you have something more than everybody else that makes you better than everybody else. Ah, oh, I see you saying, uh, yeah, Pastor. All of us know of somebody in churches um, who who think they have a um, extra dose of spirit, an extra dose of the anointing, an extra dose of the Holy Ghost that puts them above everybody else. But that that's this that, that's this Gnostic culture. In other words, we have um, self-appointed anointed folk who are Gnosticically anointed. <laughs> I just made that up. And so, 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 so these kind of people were affecting the belief system of people who were trying to live this new Christian life that Paul had taught them and was writing to them about. To them about. The people in Colossae uh, had families, servants, under, um, understood Greek, which meant they were culturally savvy. They used Roman money, worshiped various deities, um, worked primarily in the agriculture sector. It was a wealthy city that had the wool trade. Um, they, had, they had a lot of sheep and animals there that, that was a, a agrarian community. Now, here's some points you and I need to be aware of as we move forward here. Um, that there was a dangerous teaching that lessened the role of Christ 
in the believer's life. Ah, oh, that sounds like that sounds like some movements we have here, you know, like make America great again. My question is, when was America ever great? Uh, and you hear them talk about, um, you know, what we stand for, but you never hear them talk about the examples that Christ left for us. We need to know that Christ is the supreme being over all things. That Christians are united, let me say that again, Christians are united with Christ and share in this power and authority. In other words, we are in Christ. That's what it means when we say we're in Christ and Christ is in us. And here's the point. It is a charge for us to fight against personal sin. Now, I know we don't talk about that word a lot now in church culture. Here we go with culture again. Because everybody's trying to understand how to live day to day. Everybody wants, and, and, and God does want you to live a better life, but he wants you to live a sinless life too. And notice it says fights against personal sins. That means we are so busy getting our own life right that we really have no concern with anybody else's. That we pursue personal holiness. Now, don't let that word fool, um, don't let that word scare you, holiness. Do, let me say it again. Do not let the word holy, sanctified, anointed scare you. All it means is that you are set apart for divine work. Ah, oh, I just freed somebody. That you have a calling on your life, and every believer does, that you are a part of the ecclesia, the called out of God. All right? And then, then he calls for the Christians in Colossae to be spiritually mature, that you ought not be constantly immature in your faith walk. Now understand this, even though there are references to other issues that Paul writes to other churches, like um, Ephesians, the church of Ephesus, the church of Galatia, the church at Corinth, this letter is specific to the church at Colossae, for the issues that they were dealing with. And notice that Paul writes, I, Paul. So when you begin to read it, make sure you give credit to where credit is due. All right, next week's lesson. Next week's lesson is gonna read, we're gonna read chapter one in its entirety and be ready that we deal with two subjects next week, how to please God, and this, this second one I'm really gonna love, living an easy life or a great life. What, what, what do you want to live? Do you want to live an easy life or do you want to live a great life as a Christian in a non-Christian world? At the onset, I forgot to tell you that um, when, I began, when we began to publicize this lesson that I started getting a whole lot of questions um, emailed to me, text to me, inbox me. And so what I'm going to do, and I'm help this ask the sound team to make sure I do it, every week, I'm going to select one of those questions and ask the question, of course, and then try to answer it from the pastor. We're going to call it Ask the Pastor. So, so just one question. So you can send me a question, and I'll try to answer it from a biblical Christian perspective. And I may even try to answer it from my own opinion, but that's not what you want. You want the biblical Christian perspective. So here's the first one. Well, and I think it's very apropos because we are living in a culture that's very influenced by technology. As a matter of fact, when we go to conferences, many pastors have heard that if your church does not have a web page, if your church does not connect it to social media, you are already behind. It is funny to me because I remember when people said, if your church didn't have a fax machine, and now we don't even need fax numbers. As a matter of fact, you don't even need a phone number. If if you are on social media, you can be in contact with somebody. And then this question, in my belief, comes out of what we've just got. Well, we're still in COVID, but comes out of the, the, um, the move of COVID or the effects and effects that COVID had on us. So here's the question. Is worship in person necessary? Is worship in person necessary? And I, first of all, let me give you the scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 25, verse 25, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation because I want it to be clear on how we respond to this, work, this question. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now 
that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, let, let me be very honest. I, I don't want you to get upset with that, that last part, you know, because um, Jesus has been coming back and is coming back whenever he comes back, all right? I want you to get concerned with how you live so that if he comes back at this moment, you are ready, okay? Now, is worship in person necessary for the believer? Yes. Yes. One more time. I know that we have um, we have um, social media. I know we have our internet. I know that some people will watch this um, at the 12, 15 hour. Some folk will watch this at 7, 15, 7 p.m. Some folk will watch this um, at another time. Somebody else may be listening to this like they listen to Paul's podcast. Even though the Lord said he would do even, we would do even greater things that, would, that occurred than when he was living, and what we have in social media now, I think, is a gift from God. But we cannot use social media as an escape of worship and being a part of the fellowship that enhances our walk with Christ. You can't grow on an island by yourself. And let's be honest, for those of us who love the church, and I love the church. Let me try it again. I love the church. I love serving the church. Believe it or not, I love pastoring in the Lord's church, and I love preaching the Lord's word. And it, it aches me um, that people have allowed two years to affect what they used to do for a lifetime. You and I must understand that if you forsake the assembly of the believers, your belief system may become weakened. And that is a part of relationship. Uh, many, many of our children have been so affected by COVID, uh, we don't want to be relational anymore. And, and I know I, I know you said, I can worship at home. It don't have to be bothered with anybody else. Some of our greatest supporters, <laughs> uh, thank you, who are watching right now, and you might be giving right now. Thank you for your gift. Now, I'm not talking about um, those that are worshiping from other places like our disciples in North Carolina and Atlanta and, and we've got some in California and we've got some folk who are in the military that watch us and follow us, some in the District of Columbus, uh, Columbia. I'm not talking about you because I know that you are not here. That, that's us doing greater things, touching lives all around. And, and if you get sick uh, where you are, reach out to your pastor. I'm going to find a pastor there that can come meet you or if need be, I'll come pray for you where you are. So, so, so that I'm not talking about those, but I'm talking about those who are in Columbus, who are able body, who know that you need to be in fellowship. Um, we we are missing a whole lot of gifts in the body of Christ because people are choosing to sit on them and use social media and online worship as a scapegoat for our laziness. Now, I, I'm just being honest. What's interesting to me, many of you cannot work virtually. And you have to go, and even if you do work virtually, from what I understand, most of you still have to go in at least one or two days a week. So you mean to tell me you can't get your family up out of bed to come to worship on Sunday? You can't participate in the event of Bible study in person and, and, and other activities that the church might have to meet the needs of the people because we have the crutch of virtual worship. There are even some pastors out there that have ceased to have virtual worship in an effort to draw people back to the worship event in the church. And I must be honest with you. Um... Some of us use it as being, um, oh, let, let me tell you what happened. Let, let, let me tell you what happened. I would love to do this Bible study in person and let you ask questions. And, and we may can set that up where you can do it virtually. Um, but in order for us to do that virtually, I need more than just one or two people who are working the sound system and myself to be here. And I need you to be in the sanctuary and we can time ourselves. But when I put it out to our wonderful congregation that I love about returning to in-person Bible study, everybody said, well, we like the virtual Bible study. I don't have a problem with the virtual Bible study. 
I do have an issue with virtual worship, though. Yes, we worship him in spirit and in truth and in our individual lives. But there's nothing like when the saints of God are called together to worship the Lord together in spirit and truth. As a matter of fact, when the Bible says, let us, uh, let us make man, they are together. Um, Jesus went to church or went to the temple. And I would encourage you um, that you need to know that worship in person is necessary for your faith walk. Now, you ain't got to like everybody that come to church. You ain't got to sit beside them, but you do have to love them because that's what Christ told us to do. Uh, thank you tonight, um, this evening, this afternoon, whatever time it is that you are um, catching this Bible study um, lesson. I encourage you to push like, love, care, uh, whatever, uh, whatever positive comment you might have, we encourage you to come to the Trinity Church on Sundays. 9 a.m. is our new Sunday school time, and our Sunday school teachers are doing a wonderful job in making sure that they are prepared for the lesson that we have. We see you at the 10 a.m. worship experience. Um, come join us for worship where the Lord is blessing us mightily. Bring your youth and your children so they can join us with Children's Church. And we especially encourage you during this season as we're going into the fall and get ready to minister to, for Thanksgiving and Christmas and other holiday events as we lift up the name of Jesus Christ and we are compelling the world to salvation and discipleship with the love of Christ. I am Victor Davis, the pastor of the greatest church in the whole wide world, and it's been a pleasure to have your time. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Let us pray together tonight. God, we thank you that you have once again allowed us to study together to build a foundation for our next season of learning. We ask now that you give us the strength to be good Christians in a non-Christian world and that we recognize that we are the salt of the world, that we are light in this world, and that many know you because they know us. Give us strength, give us grace, give us power. Is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening. Are you dealing with any type of hurt, hang up, or addiction? We invite you to come and participate in the Breaking the Yoke of Bondage Recovery Ministry, Mondays at 7 p.m. The new start time for Sunday school is at 9 a.m. Tune in each Sunday beginning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday School lesson. The Grief Support Ministry will meet every first and third Saturday at 12 noon in the Fellowship Hall. Trinity Family and Friends, everyone is invited to join us in person and virtually on Sunday, October the 1st, as we celebrate and appreciate our pastor, Victor M. Davis, for 26 years of service unto the Lord. If you are looking for a church home, there are several ways that you can unite with Trinity. Please visit our website at www.trinity-baptist.com Click on Connect and then choose how you would like to unite with us, whether in person or virtually. We look forward into welcoming you into the family of believers.